A head is silhouetted against the sky, pierced through with a 20-foot tall spike. It bends and sways to the fierce winds going over the cathedral-like hall as it juts from the roof. Eventually, the wind blows hard enough that the oak pole snaps and the head takes this lengthy tumble to the ground. A man passing by in a guard's uniform seizes the cranium and in impulsive fashion decides to quickly take it into his possession. With the head bundled to him closely, the sentinel proceeds to make his hurried walk home, eyes darting around in fixation, and the guard eventually reaches his home and closes the door swiftly behind him. And then he holds out his prize for inspection. The teeth were missing and the nose mutilated, and the skin weathered from Mother Nature's touch. After the man had sufficiently gazed at his new trophy, he fastidiously hides it within his chimney. But that was not the end of this journey for this particular head, and today's episode is about how this noodle wound up in the midst of several different people and ended up traveling more than some of us with bodies. Now the head I spoke of belongs to Oliver Cromwell, an important and dastardly figure in British history. And we're going to go ahead and start with how that head wound up on the pike. And it begins in the middle of the 1600s with the English Civil War. Now Parliament and the Crown were at odds with each other. The King, Charles I, pretty much had the power to do what he liked. But Parliament, they were the ones with authority for taxation. This led to Charles dissolving Parliament multiple times only to reassemble them whenever he needed cash to fund his wars. There was also religious unrest, as the Puritan-dominant parliament was not too keen on the Catholic sympathizer of a king. And it was this unrest that eventually led to the Civil War. The king tried to arrest several of the parliamentary members, but they refused and took up arms against the crown, and the country then started taking sides. Thomas Fairfax led the charge against the Royalist forces, with Oliver Cromwell being his second in command, and eventually King Charles was apprehended, but what to do with him led to a schism within the parliamentary forces. Now some wanted to put Charles back in power, but with checks in place in order to limit that authority. And the others wanted him tried for treason and to be made an example. The latter won out, and Charles was soon put on trial, found guilty, and then beheaded. And this didn't sit right with Fairfax, who quickly resigned his position, leaving Oliver Cromwell to take over. And it was this time, with Cromwell in charge of the English government and the monarch dead, that some of his more infamous decisions came into play. And first, deciding to wipe out any remnants still loyal to the crown, and he wouldn't stop at England. Ireland and Scotland would also fall under the military dictatorship under the new Lord Protector through brutal war strategies. And this led to the death of around 6% of Scots and about 41% of the Irish. So yeah, a real bastard. He was also pretty unpopular in England at the time, as his Puritan values continued to constrict the nation with stringent rules. And with Cromwell banning much of their entertainment, and even Christmas, the people were having a lot of buyer's remorse. So after Cromwell died, the monarchy was reinstated and Charles II was put into power. And if you thought he was still salty about his father's death, then uh, you guessed right. One of the first states of business involved was to pardon everyone except those directly involved in the execution of his father. And this is how Cromwell's head would end up separated from his body. Now a posthumous execution would happen for him and two others. Their bodies hanging in the square for hours before being taken down for beheading. And it took eight strokes in order to sever the head which accounts for all the damage to the face, and his body, most likely, thrown into a pit. Cromwell's head was then skewered with a spike and then placed on the roof of Westminster Hall, and it remained on the House of Parliaments until a blustery storm blew it from its perch into the awaiting gaze of a nearby guard. And, like most people do when they see a head on the ground, he said, I gotta have it. I mean, right? And it was soon placed inside the guard's chimney, its secret hiding place for a few decades. Now the guard kept all of this close to his chest as the king had asked for his head back and the guard didn't exactly want to lose his and while the mug mugger was on his deathbed it seems he had told his daughter about the head and she soon sold it to a French collector. 
the collector thought it was a nice enough head in order to display in the museum, and that's where it remained until they passed. After that, it fell into the possession of someone who didn't exactly exhibit quite the same care, and a failed actor named Samuel Russell was sold the head after he had made claims that he was a distant relative of Cromwell, which those claims remain a bit dubious at best. And in that wonderful need for attention that most actors thrive on, Russell would pass the head around at drunken parties, showing it off to his guest. Now that's a conversation starter. And it was this hands-on hot potato that would lead to the irreparable damage of the head. Despite the lack of care for his distant ancestor, he refused to sell the head to a goldsmith and a clockmaker named James Cox. And this is even in the face of Russell's frugal wealth. But James, 100% had to have that head. So he concocted a plan in order to lend small amounts to Russell. When the debt had gotten high enough, James came to collect. Russell was not able to pay, so the head was transferred over to James. James Cox seemed to take this as an investment opportunity. After a decade, he sold the head for 230 pounds, which is roughly about 30,000 in the same currency in our modern era. They used it in an exhibit that included many other Cromwell-related items. Unfortunately, James Cox was not able to give a full history on the head and what happened in the unknown gaps. This led to the authenticity of the head coming into question and the brothers changing tactics. They called it the first head to be cut off and impaled after embalming. It wasn't. It was eventually passed on to one of the Hughes daughters. She continued to show the skull to anyone with interest. But in 1815, it was sold to the final family that would hold its custody. Stored in a simple oak box, the family kept the head in their home and showed it to distinguished guests. Passed on from generation to generation, this morbid family heirloom would reside with the family until 1960. Horace Wilkinson decided he was done having a dictatorial dome for an inheritance and contacted Sydney Sussex College. The college buried the skull in a small ceremony with the Wilkinsons. And that's where the head has finally come to rest. The verisimilitude of Cromwell's head has come into question. Many teams have done research on the head to various conclusions of authenticity. There are also many legends that were created surrounding his body, including it being swapped out for Charles I's body before his execution. Most evidence does seem to suggest that the skull that the college buried is the authentic one. And it just goes to show that despite all the technology that has come into play over the years, human intelligence is still pretty similar as we're still prone to create myths out of the gaps of information involved in our most influential figures. And as long as humanity remains bored, I do not see this ending anytime soon. Hopefully this episode was a bit of a fix for that. Thank you for watching Shadows of the Past. Be safe, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day.